Hi, my name is Eric Stebbins, and I'm the head of the Laboratory of Structural Microbiology here at Rockefeller University. We study bacterial proteins that cause disease, and since proteins are the nanomachines that do most of the work in life, to understand them, just like you would understand a machine, it's good to see how they're put together. So the way we do that, since proteins are at the size of atoms, we have to have special imaging techniques that will show us how all the atoms of these proteins are arranged to understand how they function. All right, so this is a, uh, a rotation suit in the lab, Mario Bartley, and she is going to uh, give you the lowdown on uh, how we do this uh, uh, cloning, genetic engineering. Mario? So you start with the DNA, so you have the gene that codes for your protein, as well as a piece of circular DNA called a vector, and we use enzymes to cut out a piece of the vector and insert our gene into it. And then we take this vector and we introduce it into bacteria, like these, so it's E. coli, and only the and then the bacteria then has the ability to express our protein because it now has the gene for it. So once we have the gene in the bacterium in a way that we can make the protein, we have to grow a lot of bacteria in flasks with a lot of food for them. They reproduce, make billions and billions of copies of themselves, and at the same time are churning out the protein that we want. So we generally grow bacteria in the liquid medium, which is called LB broth. This is a very rich medium which contains all the nutrients necessary to grow bacteria to a very high density under optimal conditions. So we use these incubators here. These incubators can take up to 12 liters of bacterial culture. So in these shakers we set up the optimal temperature for bacterial growth, which is 37 degrees, and as I mentioned, agitation of around 2 to 250 RPMs per minute. We usually grow the bacteria up to the certain density and then add the chemical inducer such as the arabinose or IPTG to trigger the production of the recombinant protein. The next step is to harvest the bacteria which we use as a protein factory as we mentioned. So to do that we transfer the bacterial culture into these flasks that you can see here and in order to pellet the bacteria we use the centrifuges and when we put the flasks filled up with the bacterial culture inside we spin them at several thousand rotations per minute for about 15 minutes and that allows us to separate the bacteria from the liquid medium. All right, so once we've uh, isolated the bacteria, uh, we uh, essentially blow them up in another machine with high pressure, and we start separating the protein that we want, that it made for us, from everything else. Uh, after the initial purification of protein, we use this machine to inject protein onto the columns that are uh, long glass tubes filled up with resin. And once they are separated, these proteins are collected and fractionated. And those tubes, they contain your protein of interest. So whatever it has your protein, it will be de determined, represented as a peak. And you pick up these fractions, you run on protein gel, and you analyze the protein, is it pure enough? If it is, then we further use this protein, either in biochemistry studies, or very free, very often in x-ray crystallography. Okay, so this is uh, our room where we do our crystallization experiments, and Amanda has a graduate student in the lab, and she's going to tell you what we do here. After we have purified protein, the next stage of the process is to try to coax it into growing crystals. And crystals are an ordered structure of protein molecules. Uh, we do this by screening through hundreds of different uh, purific er, crystallization conditions um, in these 96 well uh, plates and we store them at various stiff temperatures, either at four degrees or room temperature. Crystals then end up growing in these little wells in, on these plates 
and we can look at these crystals under a microscope. Sometimes they're big enough to see with the naked eye, but most of the time they're so small that we need to look at, use a microscope to see them. So once we have uh, grown large and very nice crystals, then we're ready for uh, the big leagues. That's when we shoot them with x-rays at a generator to start uh, collecting the images we use to reconstruct the molecular model of the protein. So once we have our beautiful protein crystals, we need to find a way to get all that molecular information out of them. And the way we do that is by shooting x-rays at them. So just like when you break a bone and have to go to the doctor and they use x-rays to see the bones in your body, we use x-rays to look at our crystals. But instead of spread out really wide, say, looking at my arm, we focus them into an ultra-narrow pinpoint beam and point them at our microscopic crystals. So in order to do that, we have little tools to hold onto our crystals. The x-rays get generated in this machine over here, focused into a narrow beam that shoots down this tube, and then pointed right at where I would put the crystal. So right now, I'm putting what would be the tool with the crystal in place. The x-rays come out of this tube here and shoot at the crystal. Now, to keep the crystal from being totally destroyed by the really intense x-rays that are coming out of this, we keep it super cold. And that's what this machine is doing here. When the x-rays bounce off the crystal, they shoot into this TV screen-like detector over here. And we can capture that information and put it into a computer. In the end, what we get uh, is a chemical model of the protein. So in blue here, you can see on this screen, this is actually the density of electrons that comes from our data. And then what we do is we build in the atoms that would fit uh, these blobs, essentially. This is what the protein looks like uh, in reality. So if we, if we had good enough eyes, we could see this instead. We use x-rays. What this tells us uh, about the protein is where all the important chemical groups are. And we can figure out how this machine functions uh, based on how it's structured. And so that is where we then connect uh, the molecular structure of the bacterial toxins to what they're actually doing in the cells that they infect. We can understand how they change our cells, uh, the exact uh, biochemistry that they're doing by uh, knowing how these machines are put together.